Hello everybody, uh, thanks for watching this. Uh, I'm very pleased today to welcome uh, Professor Dr. Fernando Valadares from Madrid, right? And in, here in our laboratory of ecology and evolution of plants from Universidade Federal de Viçosa, Brazil. So I'm, I'm really happy. I'm really glad to have you here, Fernando. And mm -hmm. would you like to introduce yourself? Like, what is your major degree, degree your mm -hmm. major uh, graduation? And why did you get here? Like, how did you get here? Why, mm -hmm. why did you choose this career? Okay. Yeah, hello. Yeah, as, as you said, I am Fernando Valadares from, from Spain. I actually belong to two institutions, to, to the university, where I give some uh, lessons and teachings and conferences on ecology and, and in the impacts of human activities on the ecosystems. And also I am a researcher at the Spanish Research Council, the CSIC, CSIC. And, and this is a research only institution uh, where we do research related to, again, the impacts of human activities uh, in, in terrestrial ecosystems, but in this case, we we measure for photosynthesis, so we study the community dynamics or different ecological aspects uh, related to global change issues. How did I get here? Well, uh, since I was a, a little child, I always liked and loved animals and plants and was very attracted by, by all sorts of, of uh, biological questions. And so from that uh, initial uh, love for nature, I uh, entered into biological studies uh, at the university, and then gradually I became, uh, with uh, quite some efforts and times of uncertainties, uh, a researcher, uh, a staff scientist of the CSIC, uh, the Spanish CSIC, where I can do uh, basically what I always wanted, although with more bureaucratic job than I thought. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh... So, did you grow up in a town or in a city or in the countryside? Did you have contact with the nature since you were a child? Well, I, I, I was mostly living in big towns. Uh, since I was 10 or so, I, I, I came to Madrid. And Madrid is a big, big city. But uh, I always managed to, to get into a bus to a nearby park or metropolitan uh, urban green area. And actually, in 15, 20 minutes from downtown Madrid, there, is, there are a couple of places where you can see wild animals and, and nice, well-preserved uh, ecosystems, the Mediterranean oak forests. Uh, so I, when I was 12, 13, 14, I, I entered into this bus in the early mornings of the weekends and, and went to, to to enjoy nature. So it was rather easy. Madrid is well located for that. And also it has the mountains not, not, not that far, an hour or so by train. And I always enjoy um, the free time walking in the mountains or in the forests. Mm. Very, very interesting. Uh, then uh, what are your major uh, research lines? You said uh, human activities, impact of human activities and the global change. But I have read like some papers, some of your papers about ecophysiology of plants and about plant ecology, plant community. Yeah. So do you like to talk a bit more? Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I initially uh, started with the ecology and ecophysiology of lichens. This symbiosis between algae and and, and uh, well uh, uh, different types of fungi, you know, uh, these lichens actually brought me to the Antarctica to study there, where the lichens are actually an important part of the landscape and they are important for the biogeochemical cycles of the small, humble, little terrestrial ecosystems. Because in in, in Antarctica, most of the land is frozen and the uh, biogeochemical cycles and the biological activity is quite low because of the low temperatures. So that was mostly in my PhD period. No? My research then expanded into more uh, into a more um, open range of ecosystems. I did some research in Mediterranean ecosystems in California, 
and also in uh, some uh, tropical uh, ecosystems in Barro Colorado, on Barro Colorado Island. Uh, I, I, I did a lot of studies on ecophysiology, uh, exploring the capacity of individual plants to respond to low light and uh, drought. Those were the two factors that I was uh, interested in understanding the physiological responses and also the architectural designs and the morphology and anatomy associated with the physiology that allowed the plants to cope with uh, low light limitations. Uh, then I enter into this um, broader concepts of phenotypic plasticity, that is the capacity of individuals to um, accommodate the physiology and the morphology and the behavior to the current environmental conditions. And this plasticity was the evolutionary and ecological concept that uh, serve as a, as a framework for most of these studies at the individual level. And gradually I moved from the individual level to the community level to see species interactions and, and how the communities uh, ensemble, how the species get together, how they complement the functional uh, features of, of, of each species. And, and this led me to the functional trait kind of a spectrum and, and, and description in, in plant communities mostly. And as I was uh, evolving and as I was involving more students and, and engaging into collaboration with other scientists, I was able to include more, more topics and more, more approaches. So ecophysiology was one way of measuring things, but then we were able to, uh, to use molecular techniques to see genetic diversity and the possibilities for evolving certain traits and, and cooperating with zoologists. We were exploring plant-animal interactions. And, and then all these kind of questions and technologies and approaches were pointing to understand better how the ecosystems, not only the individuals and the species, uh, respond and are impacted by human activities. Uh, gradually, I, I was more interested in not only the pure and abstract uh, evolutionary and ecological concepts, but also how they uh, can um, improve our, our understanding of the true impacts of our activities in the natural world. This is the nowadays for the last decade or so the main the main goal to to better quantify and understand how uh, and to in which levels uh, our activities impact the functioning, the, the sustainability of ecosystems, and the services that they provide, etc. Yeah, that's a very important topic nowadays. Correct. Many many research groups yeah. are trying to understand how the, the climate change are going to impact. Uh, humans. Mm -hmm. So, uh, do you think these are the major uh, contributions from your research, from your uh, from your work? Your uh, I, I I've also seen some of your talks. So, uh, it's like to spread, in, trying to spread the, the 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 science to 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 share the science to the people. So, mm -hmm. what, what do you think are the major contributions from your, of your research to the society? Well, uh, there are several lines of, uh, of things that can be useful for society. Uh, pure knowledge, uh, then the better understanding of Mediterranean or tropical ecosystems uh, for the sake of understanding. This is one contribution that actually has been mm, key over I will say 20 years or so, and it's still important. But, I'm, but gradually, with climate change becoming more important and global environmental change becoming more pressing and, and more urgent, uh, we, we think we should and we are doing our best to contribute to, to, with, with uh, uh, scenarios with, uh, uh, associated to our activities. So uh, if we do this, what we can expect from this ecosystem or from this community or from these individuals or from this level of genetic diversity is to be compromised or to have a threat or a risk of disappearing or, or producing less of this and that service. And, and this kind of uh, prediction 
or anticipation of uh, of the impacts of our activities on on a specific species and a specific functions are nowadays uh, the the, mo the most important um, goal for our um, research and and so forth. But also a very challenging is is to be able to communicate all this in in plain words. So it's, it's so easy for scientists and academics in general. To, to use jargon and to be very technical uh, with the specific advances in the knowledge that a given research or PhD project or, or grant uh, contributes, but uh, in part and, and make a, a synthesis of our understanding and of our contributions so they can be understood by everyone and, and they can be appreciated and incorporated even into political decisions. So. Uh, and this is a challenge, not to lose uh, scientific uh, soundness, but uh, to be uh, simple enough to be understood by anyone without a biological uh, degree or without a technical knowledge. Yeah, I agree. Like uh, transforming and showing this all this knowledge to the common, like in a common language, in a plain language, like you said. Is one of the major challenges we have, and especially how to make these scientific findings to reach our uh, decision makers, the stakeholders, the, the, the our governments, right? So these are your the major contributions to the human well-being. Well, uh, one one of the, the key questions from an ecologist that we are uh, trying to to, to understand and to be able to communicate is the, the interactions and the connections, interconnections among factors, impacts, and activities. Uh, we tend to isolate things, factors, for instance, drought, temperatures, fire hazard, or mm, whatever activity in the forest management or, or so, uh, isolate that and see the isolated impact of one single thing. Uh, I, but the things take, take, uh, take place together. And our effort is trying to, to um, understand the complexity of multiple factors acting together. And it's not only climate change, but it's climate change in addition to uh, um, resource uh, consumption and pollution and fire and a lot of things together. No? And, and this is very complicated, but this is the real life. And this is the real uh, uh, situation that we have to face. So we are exploring specifically and experimentally the interactions and, and whether the, 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 the effects are uh, additive or are uh, multiplicative or, are, or counteract one to each other, how, how the different factors uh, together uh, makes the net outcome of, uh, in, and the net impact on the ecosystems. This is our contribution, not to, not to study one single factor uh, in isolation, which is very important also. It's another approach because then you can get a deeper understanding of that particular factor, but it's less realistic because in, in real life, the factors takes place together. So we simplify the design uh, uh, because we cannot afford to go into the same level of, 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 of detail as if you go for one single factor, drought or, or whatever, or temperature or, or whatever impact you want to measure. But uh, we keep uh, the complexity at the statistical level with all the interactions and to see um, uh, a more kind of realistic picture by combining uh, the things together. This is our contribution. I think this is our our mm, relatively novel uh, contribution, no? the, the, the vision of the things simultaneously, the disappearings of a species together with, uh, in, in many dry areas, the lack of water and increasing temperatures and pollution and changes in land use. All this cocktail, this, this cocktail or co combination of factors taking place together uh, is, the, is the things that we have a couple of places in Spain where, we, where we've been monitoring and experimentally manipulating uh, the, the ecosystems to, to get information on, on that, particularly in the center of Spain, in Mediterranean uh, forest, continental Mediterranean forest. We've been doing research for almost 20 years, 
exploring the interactions of these factors. And we also got involved in European uh, projects where our particular study place, study site, was combined with six or seven other places in Europe with uh, other kinds of forests or ecosystems to see the commonalities and the differences due to the type of ecosystems. So we were combined the Mediterranean in our case with the tundra forest, with Central Europe, the deciduous forest, with pine or conifer forest. And, and then we, we uh, uh, by collaboration, we, we explore, uh, again, uh, whether what we are finding is a specific of our forest or is a more general pattern uh, common to other ecosystems when the interactions of these factors occur. In, in your opinion, what's more important among uh, uh, biodiversity study, studies for our society and human being nowadays? Mm -hmm. What's the priority? Uh, well, for me, especially these days where uh, uh, all the humanity is concerned with the COVID, is the, the, the roles, uh, the, the roles, understanding the functions associated to biodiversity. Uh, people tend to see biodiversity as a list of species. And I think we should emphasize that this list of species actually uh, perform a function, uh, many functions. And actually, the more species, the more functions, and the more sustainable are these functions, and the more resilient are these functions against perturbations. And I think this dynamic vision of the, of the functions and, and the connections between species and functions is, is one of the key messages that we have to, 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 to enforce and to communicate. Because again, we tend to think uh, as a society uh, that biodiversity is just a shopping list of species and it's much more than this. And with the COVID, uh, we are doing an effort in, even though we don't do research specifically on that, we, we are reviewing the literature and we are doing um, a, a, an effort to communicate how important is the biodiversity to uh, decrease the risk of zoonosis and pandemics. Uh, because having more species coexisting have three or four different mechanisms of protection of human beings uh, against infections. Uh, and, and so we, we try to um, illustrate and explain the main message that basically can be condensed in a sentence. The best vaccine against a, um, a pandemia or, a, or an infection or a zoonosis is, a, is nature. Nature, a well-preserved nature with a high levels of biodiversity and a functioning ecosystem is the best vaccine because it actually prevents uh, or reduces significantly the, the risk of further infections by many pathogens. The vaccine that we are now working on is a specific vaccine against a specific pathogen. And this pathogen, the coronavirus, is, is going to mutate. So we don't know whether the vaccine will be uh, efficient or not. Uh, the the, the, the uh, metaphoric vaccine of, of nature actually serves for many pathogens, not only this, and for, for many other pathogens that we don't even think they can eventually become a pathogen in the future. And, and, and this is a, a, an important message. I think this, under the current crisis of biodiversity, where we are ext uh, uh, prompting to extinction almost 200 species every day, uh, this is in between 1,000 and 10,000 times more uh, extinctions than will take place by, na by, by na natural uh, conditions. Uh, this this six extinction that we are uh, pushing uh, has uh, strong consequences on our um, possibilities for survival and of course for our well-being. And, and one illustration of that is actually the, 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 the protection against pandemics. It, it serves many other functions. Sometimes we know, sometimes we don't know. Very few people knew about this this protection of uh, biodiversity by biodiversity against uh, zoonosis and pandemics. But now uh, I think people are very sensitive to this message and are, are are very interested in understanding better why, how biodiversity protects us, and 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 and, and this provides another reason 
uh, one more reason, and in this case, a particularly strong reason to protect biodiversity and, and to refrain this trend for decreasing the number of species. Sometimes we extinct species uh, without knowing what we are doing. We don't do that on purpose. We just uh, develop uh, certain activities, uh, alter the habitats, and as a consequence of these activities, uh, then some species are lost. And now we think it's time to reconsider that because the loss of a species is, is having an impact on, on our lives, on our current lives, not only uh, after uh, or uh, under ethical or moral uh, responsibilities, you know, that we should keep the species alive or so. This is much more crude and direct than that, is, is that actually our survival depends on the existence of these species out there. You know? And um, it's interesting to also to highlight uh, the climate changes that mm -hmm. the, the world is facing now, especially because, basically because of uh, human activities. So uh, about climate change, I've heard that you have done some research and you're really dedicated now to this topic. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you like to talk a little bit more? Sure. Yeah, I enter into the like climate change in this pandemic scenario, because I've, I've read that many, there is a, the risk that many virus and other pathogens that were, for example, frozen, that they mm -hmm. were literally frozen, they now can, for example, come back to life. Yeah. And of all the uh, ecosystem functioning that you have already mentioned, mm -hmm. but we all have this risk, right? Yes. Well, this is a, a good example of interaction. And this these kind of interactions are, very interesting for us as a, as a research topic, but it's also very relevant for the society because, again, this is the reality. The reality is that we, we are involved into a climatic emergency, in a climatic uh, crisis. Uh, we are warming up the atmosphere, and this is having a lot of consequences in the, in the, in the climate all over the world. In many places, uh, we get drier conditions, in other, too much water, uh, uh, very extreme uh, conditions and, and extreme events. Uh, so the, the, the climate is changing in many aspects due to this warming of the atmosphere, to, due to this increase in the energy that, that is uh, intercepted and, and captured by the atmosphere. And, and this is uh, actually occurring at the same time than other problems. No? And, and now we have a sanitary problem with these pandemics. And, and we have many threats by uh, all the pathogens that, as you said, are frozen or has been kept frozen in glaciers or in the permafrost for, for centuries or for millennia. And now with the climate change, uh, the, 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 the ice is melting and some of these potential pathogens or these unknown microorganisms or virus um, are released. And the possibilities are um, a little scary. Um, we don't know much about them. Uh, many are not um, pathogenic at all. They are just uh, microbia that are not known by scientists. But uh, uh, but some of them may have potentials for uh, being being a threat. Actually, some varieties of the Spanish flu, for instance, were frozen and now released, uh, or, or anthrax. Uh, the anthrax in Siberia that was frozen and, and then unfroze, unfrozen and released it was causing uh, several problems, uh, health problems. Local, so far they were local, but the potentials to become more widespread and general as the warming keeps going uh, uh, are, are important. So this is a, an example of an interaction no, between climate change and a pandemic and a zoonosis and a risk of infection. And in many cases, the, the infections and the zoonosis are, uh, requires a, a vector, a mosquito or a, or a tick. Uh, they are the two most important ones. And ticks and mosquitoes uh, are um, promoted uh, by warming conditions. In general, in temperate countries, in, in northern and southern latitudes farther away from the from the equator and the tropics um, the warmer conditions the warming uh, climate is increasing the activity of these vectors 
is actually allowing some exotic tropical origin uh, vectors to get established and to get active. So they can now spread tropical uh, uh, illnesses or tropical infections into non-tropical latitudes because of the of the warming. This is again another case of interaction that is uh, complex but is important because it's what is actually happening. No, in in parallel, the climate change and the uh, and the uh, changes in the distribution of species and the activity of some of the species that are actually holding or uh, transmitting. Uh, uh, infectious diseases. Yes, uh, that's that's very interesting to hear because um, we we are used to it here. Uh, for example, to the dengue flu, the yellow fever, and the, the uh, African mosquito that was brought here became well uh, well established and widespread. And possibly these these mosquitoes, as you said, are going to go much mm -hmm. further and then populations that are not used to it mm -hmm. But also uh, it's important mm, to see not only that the tropical things are moving to the non-tropical latitudes or regions, but also uh, as the destruction of the tropical forest, for instance, is taking place, now the, the source for zoonosis and, and potential pandemics are moving from the temperate zones 40 or 50 years ago most of the origins of the zoonotic infections were temperate zones in, in North America, in Europe. And you can see that the origins of, of infections from animal uh, origin was, was taking place in temperate zones. Now, the, the, the deforestation and the degradation of uh, tropical ecosystems is uh, associated now with a tropical uh, blooming of potential pathogens uh, in this in this region, so and this is again another case of interaction. No? Is the human activities directly affecting the tropical ecosystems nowadays? Because the technology allows for for a higher impact and a higher scale, larger scale impact uh, of, of human activities in tropical ecosystems that probably 30 or 40 years ago we didn't have the capacity to impact to this to, to the same extent. And now we are able to destroy or to move or to change uh, big uh, parts of, of the Amazon forest or the African tropical rainforest. And, and this is having a, a now not only a, a local impact in, in, the, in these places, but also increasing the risks for uh, new uh, zoonotic infections and pandemics. Uh, therefore, uh, this is a really, really important argument. Another argument to convince uh, the stakeholders to stop this deforestation. Mm -hmm. that and, but we have, to, we have to be creative in, in providing alternatives because um, I don't think it's very useful and practical to forbid, to stop, to deny, to, to punish, uh, because this has a limit. <clears throat> if you enforce a law, uh, a fraction of the people will manage to avoid that law or so by by this way we only reach a certain percentage of accomplishment and we need to to uh, to to provide alternatives and this has to be an international concerted action from from different countries from different communities to see that there is um, a planetary health that uh, the health of of all human beings uh, is is uh, is connected somehow among the different humans, but also with ecosystems. And this, this international uh, collaboration should uh, be able to provide alternatives to people, to local uh, people that are doing activities that are not sustainable, that are uh, deteriorating the quality of the environment, that are uh, threatening the biodiversity. Uh, I think this is an effort that we all have to do. It's not only a question of the government uh, forbids, this activity or mm, we punish people killing animals or, or deforestating. Well, uh, we need to offer them uh, alternatives. We need to provide uh, economic incentives to do other activities. We need to, to, to be uh, and to, to understand the complexity of, of that. It's not only a question, you don't do this because it will not work that way. Uh, for instance, in Africa, uh, in Africa, it's very important the, what is called the bush meat, 
So the people actually eat all sorts of animals in the, in the forest because they don't have other sources of protein. Uh, it's as crude and as simple as that. And, and if you say, no, this animal is, is, is forbidden, you cannot kill it, well, they will say, you do whatever, you say whatever, but I am hungry and I will eat it. No? So you need, to, you need to provide alternatives, uh, economic alternatives, that these people can actually uh, move from eating every animal that they, that they find to uh, eat only certain animals and uh, in parallel develop a, a local economy that allows them to, to survive in, 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 a, in more harmony with the, with the ecosystems instead of exploiting and over exploiting the, the ecosystems because they, they cannot do other things. They don't know, they don't have the technology, they don't have the possibilities. So it's, that's why I'm, I'm saying that the ecologists have to, to explain well the connections uh, but also have to to talk to economists and and be able to engage into into multidisciplinary teams uh, involving politicians yeah. the society so, oh, to, yeah. to be able to to reach a, a, a more solid uh, proposal no? sure sure yes uh, the, one of the the main words nowadays is like the, the multidisciplinary uh, approaches mm -hmm. exactly uh, so uh, just to come to an end, like uh, of our conversation, uh, mm -hmm. do you think there is any uh, environment, any ecosystem in Brazil or in Latin America, in, in, in or in, in the rest of the world uh, that you think it's neglected in terms of ecological studies, in terms of attention for conservation measures? Yeah, well, the, the, the Amazonian forest is still um, poorly understood. It's so complex. Uh, the, we don't even know the, the number of three species that are there. There are only mathematical models extrapolating how many species could be, how many thousands of three species could be. So uh, this is an example of a very complex ecosystem. And in some cases, even the logistics to, to do research there uh, are, are so complicated that makes the, the, the uh, development and the advance uh, a, a, real, a, a real challenge. You know? So the, the, the Amazon, even though it is so famous and many people willing to, to study it and, and many international teams from Europe or from North America or, or are, are willing to to, to, to do research in Amazonian. The Amazonian is so complex that we only know a little part of, of all the species and the processes and the sensitivities. We get big numbers of the Amazonian forest um, doing worse and worse, fixing less and less carbon. And we only understand part of it. Uh, it, it cannot be explained only by deforestation. The, 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 the trees that remains in place are doing worse and we don't understand exactly why. Uh, and there are many things to be done uh, on the site, on the spot, and that requires field, field work that is hard to do. Um, we get a lot of nice satellite images from the Amazonian forest and we can track the fires, we can track the, even the, the amount of chlorophyll or things like that. But there are many mechanisms that we don't understand and requires a lot of uh, expertise to understand the species, to identify the trees, but also efforts and human uh, mass and human power uh, to, do, to do research there. There are other uh, important uh, ecosystems like the Cerrado uh, ecosystem, which is an interesting one in terms of the interaction between human activities and natural processes. No? The Cerrado has all uh, a, a very extensive gradient from almost pristine and untouched and rather well preserved uh, to the very degraded and very altered and very uh, human uh, managed uh, type of Cerrado ecosystem. So we have a gradient and this can serve not only for the Cerrado itself, but also as a study system for, for other ecosystems like the savanna in Africa or many, many uh, open woodlands in, in, in Asia or in other areas. So I think the Cerrado also is very interesting. I think the complexity is less than, uh, than the Amazonian, 
but the the timing for for it is is very high because of this um, gradient of human intervention that makes it um, very important as a study system, as a model system to to make important questions in a global change scenario. Uh, thanks, uh, Fernando. Uh, I think just to finish, uh, do you have uh, uh, do you are you part of any graduate team, any graduate program? master and doctor PhD students uh, now? Yeah. Yes, I am involved in, in, in a couple of them and, and we are um, uh, trying to provide skills in, in many aspects, not only in the ecological, biological knowledge and understanding, but also in, in, in the tools like uh, statistics or molecular and, and also the communication skills uh, that I was mentioning at the beginning, communicating to other scientists, communicating to society. They, 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 mm, we em, eh, enforce a lot the, the communication skills at different levels and with different formats. It can be videos, it can be audios, it can be uh, uh, online, uh, direct, or it can, exactly. Or and, and, or... Exactly. This is very important because uh, in order to to get uh, um, the society moving in this uh, in, in this necessary change uh, of, of of our relationship with the nature with the environment and with nature, uh, we we need to be able to communicate the interesting and fascinating aspects of our research, the implications for our safety and life life quality, and so we have to be able to communicate good and bad, positive and negative uh, findings and results. And, 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 and this is something that we, we practice a lot with the students. We do a lot of little exercises and, and we challenge ourselves with press releases and, and with little uh, summaries of their PhDs or the, or the, or the research uh, projects uh, to, to condense, to communicate, to go to the essence, to connect with uh, things that are of concern for the society and eventually for for the managers or for the rectors and deans of the university for people that can say okay i only have this limited amount of money whether i give it to the people doing engineers or ecology or plant biology or what and then you need to be able hey we the ecologists are important because of this and this and this then you make your decision but you have to be able to to communicate why it's important to study, to research, and to understand uh, ecosystems and ecology and plant biology in general. Yeah. And have any other recommendations to students, to young researchers, mm -hmm. or general public? For example, any recommendation like reading? Well, for, for me, the, the, there are a list, uh, a, a sort of a list of recommendations of different types. On the first hand, I think we, we need to enjoy what we are doing to do it well. Uh, sometimes we do things because we think we have to do it. Uh, and and we, we are in a fortunate situation because actually nature and the, the, the understanding and the studying of nature can, can actually be very rewarding. So try to always keep this, this attitude of enjoying understanding enjoying learning, enjoying, even if you have to spend 14 hours under the sun, <laughs> sweating and, 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 and beaten by mosquitoes, still uh, uh, enjoy what you are doing, uh, get this, uh, this, this enthusiasm that can uh, get, can, can be got, uh, can be obtained from, from the study of nature. Don't, don't lose that. If you are doing something that at some point is not so rewarding, uh, stop and analyze why it's not rewarding, what are you doing wrong, and why are you losing your interest and your enthusiasm? Because this is a long-term kind of activity, either the research, the PhD, or whatever, and even the communication to the society has to be sustained years after years, no? So it's a, it's a, it's a, it has to be taken as a long-term marathon kind of, no? Uh, so if, if you uh, run out of motivation, if you run out of happiness in your, in your work, stop and think why is this happening, either because the, the objectives are not 
that rewarding or because something is wrong or you are losing your motivation, stop. It's, it's very important to stop and, and renew your batteries, renew your attitude and, 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 and be active and motivated again because you will have to fight against all sorts of complexities, difficulties. Uh, uh, it will be uh, plenty of obstacles. The, the actual daily life of the research is, is like that, but also when you find out that the biodiversity is decreasing or the climate change is impacting this and that, you are always having bad news. Uh, mm -hmm. So you need to compensate the bad news with a, with a positive attitude and you need to, to, to take care of this attitude and to, to, to take care of yourself in this, in this kind of motivation and, and positive attitude in, in your work. You, you need to love what you do because otherwise all these negative uh, things either by the bureaucratic and daily life sort of things and also because of the bad news regarding the environment will will actually uh, 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 make you very stressful and, and anxious and, and eventually sad or, or too much worry you know? you need to compensate for that and, and to take it as a long-term uh, activity that requires uh, endurance yes oh yes very 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 good uh, conclusions and uh, recommendations. Thank you very, very much, Fernando. My uh, pleasure. Fernando Valadares from Madrid. I'm really, ha I'm really glad that you, you took some time to, to talk with us. It is so, my pleasure. It's really my pleasure. It's been really fun to, to be able to share my experiences and, and I hope my message can be inspiring or useful for, for the people hearing or listening to us. Thank you very much, very much, and as soon as you, uh, the situation gets better, we, you are very welcome here. Sure, thank you. Thank you.